Stanford University. Wow, that's a big crowd. Hi. <laughs> Um, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to share um, some work that my research group has been doing with support from the Woods Institute through an Environmental Ventures Project grant. Um, we're really focused in the group on environmental health issues, and so I'll motivate this with just um, a few pieces of information that some of you may know and some of you may not. Um, let's see. So Roz was focused on fish feces. As Lynn mentioned, my research group is called the poop group, and we've, we focus on feces of another sort. Um, and although we try to keep a, a light heart about it, what's motivating us are some of the statistics that you see here. Um, each year, we're losing one and a half million kids under the age of five to diarrhea, to diarrhea. And so about 4,100 um, uh, per day on average, or 30 in the time, if uh, Paula cuts me off on time, and 30 in the time that I'll have to share the research with you. So this is really what we're, what we're thinking about on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and given that this is an illness, I mean, isn't this just a question for the medicine community? Why, you know, a, a child who comes down with diarrhea in this country um, is very unlikely to die from it. So really, shouldn't we be focusing on a medicinal approach? And in fact, advances in medical science have been very important for reducing mortality from diarrhea um, with advances such as oral rehydration therapy. But that doesn't prevent kids from getting sick. That just makes sure that sick kids don't die. And in fact, the incidence of, of diarrheal illnesses around the world, particularly in developing countries, has continued to increase year after year. It's actually the combination of medical science with environmental engineering and microbiology that starts to unpack the specific pathogens that are responsible for this illness. And then we can start thinking about things that are more preventative in nature, um, such as the recently available rotavirus vaccine. So that's a great collaborative effort that led to a, an important advance. But we also know that fully 90% of this illness, these, these deaths in kids, can be traced to inadequate water supply, sanitation, and hygiene. We actually know what would give us the biggest bang for the buck in terms of prevention. So then you ask yourself, okay, well maybe this is just an engineering problem, right? We, we know how to deliver clean water and we know how to get rid of waste and I've heard a lot about that actually from some of my colleagues. Um, so why aren't we just doing more of that? And in particular, why don't we deliver low cost, uh, water supplies and low-cost sanitations to these low-income countries where we're having so much uh, child mortality from diarrhea. And um, that's true, and it is true that, you know, there's still a large service gap around the world. About a billion people don't have access to improved water supply, and two and a half times that many. So that's almost 40 percent of the Earth's population uh, doesn't have access to even the most basic form of sanitation. So maybe that will solve the problem. But what we found really uh, over the last decade or two from applied research is that the kinds of solutions that you see here, which are very common in low-income countries, so hand, bore wells with hand pumps, latrines, et cetera, they actually have a very mixed record in terms of delivering health benefits. And if you think about it for just a couple of minutes, it's pretty easy to see why. Diarrheal illness is, tends to be caused by the feces of one person getting into the mouth of another person one way or another, yeah? So um, when you have a, a system like this, you could be delivering very clean water at this hand pump, but you still have to get it in a container, you have to get it home, you have to keep it clean, you've got kids running around, right? Um, and eventually you're going to use it. Is it still clean at that point? Maybe, maybe not. And the other issue about the, the sanitation, I, I, I'm gonna get Craig down to Tanzania soon, I promise. But, um, you know, what we've done in, in having on-site sanitation, these latrines, these household um, solutions for sanitation in the rest of the world, is we've actually made households responsible for managing a hazardous waste, right? So feces uh, is, when not properly managed, a huge public health uh, threat. So we're, we're trying to understand here um, how to match the infrastructure investments, right, an understanding of the actual causal pathogens that are causing this illness um, with the behavioral aspects that have got to go hand in hand 
uh, with getting real health benefits from water and sanitation investments. So now I've described to you a problem that actually requires the talents of lots of different kinds of people, of engineers, of uh, medical experts, um, of microbiologists, of public health specialists, and microeconomics, microeconomists. And that's okay, because that's exactly the sort of multidisciplinary, problem-focused uh, collaboration that the Woods Institute loves to see happen. Right? So um, we are working on this problem in a particular context um, in, in Tanzania. Uh, one in nine children doesn't make it to their, to their fifth birthday in, in Tanzania. And um, as the mother of a child who turned five, five days ago, just to coincide with this fifth anniversary symposium. Um, you know, that's, it, it really gets to you. So um, we have great collaborators on the ground, and this is critically important in our view for translating the results of this research that the Woods Institute has supported into actual programmatic change. And the most important partner in that respect is the water utility of Dar es Salaam, and they are um, one of our most enthusiastic partners because they're putting a lot of time and energy into improving water supplies in the peri-urban zones of Dar es Salaam, and they want there to be an impact. They want to see um, a real environmental health boost off of what they're doing, and they haven't yet, and so we're trying to help them understand why. So as I said, their job is to put in the infrastructure, and they're doing um, a good job at this. They're moving as fast as they can, and we have tested... A, uh, we have tested the water in these boreholes, and it's of pretty good quality, actually. Um, our job is to help them understand what are the specific pathogens that could be causing disease, and also what they could be doing differently or with other partners could be doing differently to ensure that households are changing their water management behaviors, their sanitation and hygiene behaviors, so that we actually see uh, a health benefit from all of this work and all of this investment. So our group tends to work um, very intensively in the field with local collaborators. So we train our local enumerators. Um, we're doing, uh, in, in this EVP-sponsored study, we are doing repeated visits to 300 households and collecting a lot of information from them. But we're also uh, sampling the stored water in their homes and evaluating it um, for indications of fecal contamination. We're sampling the hands of kids and mothers and trying to understand it, what, uh, how that contributes to the route of exposure. Um, and we're involving a lot of students from the undergraduate up to the, the doctoral level. So um, I can already see that I'm running over and it's always hard to, to do the last presentation because everyone's um, got a full brain. So let me, let me try to summarize it this way. There is a, um, a presumption in much of the environmental health field that uh, people in low- and middle-income countries are largely ignorant of the links between water supply, sanitation, and health. And if they only understood a little bit more, then they would do things differently. Um, we came at this with a different hypothesis because when we sit in our research group meetings, we can always identify um, lots of healthful behaviors that we know we should be practicing on a regular basis, but we don't. So maybe it's not a matter of education. Maybe it's a matter of bringing something uh, a little bit more personal and ca capturing someone's attention and trying to focus on small messages that are surprising and personalized. So what you're seeing here is what we tried to, to do um, in Tanzania. On this, on this front. We collected all of the information about the water and hand test results. We presented it in Kiswahili with lots of pictures so that literacy was not an issue. And we took it house by house and talked to moms who had under five kids. And we said, not generally contaminated water leads to health, uh, bad health, but that bucket of water right behind you that we sampled last week had this much um, level of contamination and your child's hand, and your second child, and your third, and your hand was this contaminated. And what we're finding, <clears throat> I'll jump to this. First of all, as I said, um, I, I won't go into this too much, but bore wells are clean, stored water is dirty, hands are really dirty, so any of you with young kids are probably not surprised by that. There are lots of stuff on the kids' hands. Um, so, but let me show you this, right? What we're finding is that uh, 
this information matters, and it matters a lot more than sort of a generic health message that we tend to see in water and sanitation programs in developing countries. This group here started out with the highest level of contamination uh, in their stored drinking water, and we told them that. And by the end of this study, they were down tracking with everyone else. Okay. That's good news. That implies that there might be something here, that testing, regular testing and talking to community members about it could give us a, a health boost. But let me show you the, the surprise. We weren't ready for this. this. These are hand data. This group, the nice pink line, they started out with the cleanest hands, and we told them that said, hey, your hands are pretty clean, and relative to all your neighbors, you're a pretty clean household. And when we came back, <laughs> so that kind of boomerang effect has actually been documented in other subfields of public health, but we hadn't expected it. So this is, this is sort of the, the flip side of, of a solution that we're going to have to think really carefully about as we go forward. Um, and in terms of next steps, um, I, I know that Buzz was talking about leveraging uh, EVP funds for additional support of, of work. We've been very fortunate in this regard. This work's generated a lot of interest, and we've now um, secured funding to expand this work to include 1,200 households, and we'll be able to follow them for a full year. And that will, be able, that will allow us to not just look at contamination levels, but to see how changes in those contamination levels actually translate into child health, and, and ultimately, we hope, reduce uh, child mortality. So we're really looking forward to getting started on that. We launch in January. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.